things run differently. All right, so let me start over again. Welcome to the sketchbook workshop. I'm excited that you're here. Uh, looks like we have a good group. Um, wanted to um, do this sketchbook workshop for some time. I'm a little disappointed that we're in COVID-19 and in a pandemic, which then means, right, that uh, we can't meet together as a group on campus and actually do some hands-on activities. However, I think there are some questions that I receive uh, on a consistent basis as a faculty member here at UVU that I feel would be worth addressing in this first workshop. So instead of waiting until the pandemic is over, um, I think it's a good time to talk to you all about sketchbooks. Um, I field um, lots of questions about sketchbooks, in particular how it relates to um, applying for the BFA in illustration. However, even in my drawing one classes, when I talk about uh, sketchbooks, students have questions. And so I wanted to uh, address four main questions today um, that will, uh, that I receive, uh, uh, you know, on a regular basis. Um, just a word of caution today, uh, as a uh, live stream event, there is a slight delay uh, between when I speak and when you hear. So um, any sort of live questions or comments, um, I don't see them for a few minutes. And in fact, live stream is sort of run slightly different than maybe your online uh, remote courses. So there will be, um, I, I have to sort of moderate your questions in the Q&A but I do want to leave time to have some uh, question and answer period. Um, so I will uh, make sure that that is all set up and um, we will try and get to as many questions as possible. So um, if you have questions during um, the presentation, please enter them in the Q&A live stream. Um, they don't all automatically uh, sort of get published. Um, that's usually done by a moderator, but I don't have a moderator today. It's just sort of a one man band thing here. So um, please be patient with me on that. We're all learning. This is uh, kind of an exciting uh, time. So welcome to the workshop. All right. So first things first. Here are four questions that I receive from students on a continual basis. And, um, and so I'm gonna offer some solutions and some answers to these questions that hopefully are useful to you. Now, you might already know some of the answers. Um, some things might be new. Um, some things uh, might be suggested that um, you might wanna try. So as I um, go through these, please, if you have a piece of paper and a pencil, um, or maybe you've got your sketchbook with you right now, I jot a few notes down. Um, and I think these things will be really helpful to you as you sort of fill your sketchbooks. I'm going to address the following. Number one, what kind of sketchbook should I use? Um, and there's a whole lot of options here, and so I'm gonna go through and answer that question. Number two, what should I draw in my sketchbook, right? So this is a common question. Um, you know, what should I draw with? Should I be using pen? Should I be using ballpoint pen? Some faculty uh, maybe might be asking you to draw in a sketchbook with a specific material. So we're gonna talk about different materials that work really great in sketchbooks. Number three, the question, how often should I be drawing in my sketchbook? Um, this is a common question. Uh, is this a daily event? You know, how many pages should I be doing a day? Whatever, so we're gonna talk about that. And then lastly, what should I be filling my sketchbook with? Right? What kind of drawings? What are the exercises and things that um, both faculty like to see when you're applying maybe for a BFA program? Or what are the kinds of things that will help you grow as an artist? So as I go through these uh, four questions, um, hopefully that answers maybe many of the concerns that you've had as you've thought about um, sketchbooking and what this all means. It's very different, right? to uh, sort of take a, the idea of sketchbook and use it as a, a creative tool as opposed to just something fun to do, right? Not that there's anything wrong with that uh, second um, thing, but I, I really think that a sketchbook is a tool just like your pencil um, in which you can sort of develop your creativity, um, solve visual problems, 
um, have fun in all of that. So let's talk about that. All right, number one, what kind of sketchbook should I use? So I'm going to present you with a whole bunch of sketchbooks. Here is a stack of sketchbooks. All right, and there's a whole bunch of different options here. Let's talk about this. All right, number one, really, your choice in sketchbook um, is based on an idea of what is going to work best for you, right? And you might want to try a few different kinds of sketchbooks to see how it fits with your creative goals. Um, and different size sketchbooks, different kinds of paper, different binding methods, all will sort of um, dictate your uh, response to this question of what kind of sketchbook should I use? Sometimes it's financial, right? I have to, you know, I don't have a lot of money. I need to buy the cheapest sketchbook. Sometimes uh, people are really into craft. You might be making your own sketchbook and so on. So let's talk about that. Number one, um, a common one that a lot of people like to get is just a simple hardbound sketchbook. So hardbound spine, decent cover, right? Pretty good paper on the inside. Um, I happen to like, this is called the landscape format sketchbook in that the binding is on the short side as opposed to the long side. I'm left-handed person. Um, and so that just helps me when drawing that I can sort of work on separate pages or I can flip it upside down or I can work like this. Um, but I happen to like the hardbound sketchbooks. Again, they look really nice on the shelf when you're all finished and um, they, withstand a little bit more abuse than some of the other sketchbooks because of this hard cover, right? The edges might get a little tattered and torn, but that's okay. Um, and these are relatively inexpensive and you can buy them just about everywhere, right? So hardbound sketchbooks are great. Maybe you already own one like this. Another option is a softbound sketchbook, right? So Moleskine, which is a brand name, um, sells these in a sort of a packet of three. And what's really great about these um, is their portability. They're lightweight. They You can jam them in just about any sort of pocket of your coat. Um, they make them in different sizes. Um, the paper, oftentimes in these, uh, in some of the soft uh, bound notebooks aren't quite as uh, robust as the um, hard bound sketchbooks, but you know, there are fewer pages. You might fill up sketchbooks faster. Um, and they're very convenient. So softbound sketchbooks are really comfortable to draw with. The other thing is most softbound sketchbooks will lay completely flat. So if you are, again, like a left-handed person like myself, where you're resting your hand across the, um, the border here or the, the gutter of the book, um, it's quite um, comfortable and I don't have to, uh, you know, I, I'm not dealing with any sort of weird binding that sort of bothers my hand. So that's kind of nice. Um, so softbound sketchbooks are really great. And you can get them in all sorts of varieties of papers, um, but I happen to like the Moleskine brand. And you get three, of, two or three of them to a pack when you buy them. So for like 20 bucks, you get three thin sketchbooks. All right, another common uh, sketchbook would be like wirebound sketchbooks. So here are sort of three examples of wirebound sketchbooks, okay? I think I just got this at the UVU uh, bookstore. Works really great. The paper's actually pretty decent in this one. Um, the nice thing about wirebound sketchbooks is you can fold the, the um, you know, the opposite page all the way back. So, so that's kind of convenient. You don't have this, you know, half of your sketchbook you know always open and that, that can be a little awkward you can sort of fold it completely back and just work on half of the book um, and i think that's really advantageous for some people really like that um, you know and again it kind of works like um, my heart bound where i can fold it back and then draw this way right um, instead of this way so i, I think that's um, these are really great and again you can get them in different covers so this is a soft cover spiral bound, right? So it's flexible with just sort of a cardboard cover. 
This one is a hardbound cover, which is nice. It'll protect the paper. Um, this is watercolor paper. So um, again, the nice thing about having maybe these is if I do a really great painting in my watercolor sketchbook, I can cut it out um, and then just continue painting. I can flap, you know, the whole thing back. Um, you know, you know, work out in the field if I want to go outside and, and landscape paint. Um, so again, uh, wirebound sketchbooks are great. And like any sketchbook, um, they're sort of delivered in different sizes. So here's just like a giant right, sketchbook. It's a little unwieldy, um, but again, it's like having some nice paper um, with a hardbound cover protect the paper and the drawings after I'm done, but I can flip it back and, and that's kind of nice. So those are spiral bound um, or wire bound sketchbooks. Um, uh, it, some of the other things I think that are a lot of fun to do is to uh, make your own sketchbook, right? So this is a Coptic stitched sketchbook, okay? So this is one I made myself um, where I just gathered up a bunch of drawing paper um, that I liked. I bought it in a pad. I tore it out. Um, I folded up uh, the pages to turn into what we would call signatures, right? So each signature has a certain number of pages. And then I uh, stitched them together using a Coptic stitch method, right? Which is kind of an old binding method. Um, I made hardcover, sort of cardboard um, covers, which I uh, put sort of beautiful marbled paper on. Um, this takes a little bit of time. It probably took me a whole afternoon into the evening. Um, made a lot of signatures in here, so this has got a lot of pages. Um, it's held up quite well, um, transporting it. The paper on this cover is starting to get really tattered, but that's okay because it's sort of showing its age and its use. Um, one of the things that's really great about this kind of binding method, again, like um, other, uh, one of our previous sketchbooks, is when I open it, it lays completely flat. So again, it's not uncomfortable to draw in, and especially for you lefties, um, you might want to consider something like that. But even if you're a righty and you're drawing over here, right, same sort of principle applies. So these Coptic stitch sketchbooks are, are a lot of fun to do. And you can find instructions um, online that are really quite simple to follow. Um, a person that uh, has a really good web or a YouTube channel is called like, um, oh, I'll have to think of it now that I'm lemon something or other. Anyway, um, but you, if you just sort of Google or get on YouTube and search Coptic Stitch book binding, you'll find a lot of sort of how-to videos on how to do this. And you can do it yourself with simple materials. You just need a needle, you need something to fold, help fold the paper, um, you need some thread, you can just buy hemp thread or linen thread to, uh, to do it. And if you want to do decorative paper, you can, but you can cover your uh, sketchbooks with just about anything. And um, they're a lot of fun to work on. And then you have something completely personalized that you made um, and you filled with your drawings. So a really fun opportunity. Now, um, for those of you who are more sort of fine art orientated, um, you can uh, also sort of get into book binding where you can do alternative binding methods like accordion fold books. So this is a couple of sheets of paper that are sort of tabbed together to create um, a long, so I could open right, my book into this long series of small images. Um, and it can be like one continuous drawing or it can be a series of small drawings and you can turn it like regular pages. Um, these are really quite easy again to make. And if you look online for instructions on how to do an accordion fold book, um, they're quite simple to follow. Um, this was just a, a project that I did where it was a series of compositions. Um, these are all collaged in, um, painted and collaged in. So it's like my own little paintings and, and found imagery and then just collaged in. And they're all the same size. And I thought the accordion style would work really great as a display of this kind of work, right? So you can even almost think of this as like a portfolio of work and you could maybe even those of you who like to do illustrations or sketch or the character designs you could do that and then bind them into another book and that's kind of considered a sketchbook right same thing with this one this is a pamphlet stitched book right it's very simple um binding method there's only two signatures to this book it has a soft cover that i made with uh, thin um 
board. It's covered with this sort of beautiful handmade paper. Um, it's done on watercolor paper so that the edges of all the pages have this kind of wonderful deckle edge, right? The other edges of the paper are cut. So um, and then all the binding is sort of hidden, right, in, behind this cover. But these are a lot of fun to do. And if you get into book binding, um, I think one thing that we might want to try when we're all back onto campus is maybe have a uh, an afternoon or evening where we do a workshop and just everybody bind a simple book. If you don't um, want to get that into the weeds on binding a little sketchbook, you can do something like this, which is just a simple um, soft bound uh, sketchbook that is made with just some scrap paper that I had that I just then cut down to a specific size. I just used some uh, cover weight paper, cut it to the same size, and staple it. So this is a stapled binding, and I'm sure most of you have a stapler. You could make your own sort of pocket sketchbooks in this way. And in fact, I'm just going to kind of show you how that's done. So earlier today, um, I had some scrap paper. This is kind of a nice light green paper. Um, I cut it to the size of, um, you can buy these small Moleskine sketchbooks or, or blank books that are like three and a half by five, I think, or five and a half, three and a half by five and a half. Um, that's the dimensions. Um, and I use them for taking notes or if I need to go somewhere and I just want to make sure that I have a sketchbook with me. Um, portability is kind of a nice thing. So if it fits in my pocket, it's awesome. Um, and you know, what do I do with all this scrap paper? Well, I just fold it up into some small sheets. I stack it all together right, like this. So I've got a little end cover sheet and then I've got my pages and it all depends on you how many pages you want, but you know, your stapler can only get through a certain number. So at some point you're going to have to decide like, is that eight or is that 10? Um, for my stapler, it's about eight or 10. And then I just took um, some Bristol paper here and painted on it with I think acrylic paint or maybe this was like watercolor mixed with um, something else. It's, it was done so long ago I can't remember but I thought well that kind of matches really nicely. So I can line all that stuff up and then I can take my stapler. So I have this ridiculous huge stapler here. And then it has a little um, thing here to help me guide me where it's going to put the staples. And then from the outside in, I just staple the binding together. Now I've got, you know, a little DIY sketchbook that was cheap and easy. You don't have to have nice paper to do this. You can do it with just, you know, bond paper or printer copy paper. Um, or if you have, you know, you can mix the different kinds of papers that you might be using, uh, mix and match so that you have a variety of papers. And if you really get into it like I have, um, so this is a little corner cutter and I don't like these sort of sharp corners. So I take my little corner trimmer. It has different radius, so let's use the tin. I can clip it. Oh, that's a terrible job then. I can trim the corner and get a nice rounded corner. And so I just go through all the pages so that when I'm finished, it looks like this, right? Where I've got nice rounded corners. That way it um, sort of lasts a little bit longer as it's going in and out of pockets or bags or whatever. So, so you can make your own sketchbooks, right? Which are really great. Um, now, if you don't have a ton of money, um, if you go to a store like Barnes and Noble, they always have like these um, bargain tables where they're selling really uh, stuff at you know real cheap prices. This is one of those sketchbooks that they sell there. Um, I think it cost me four dollars. The paper is not great, right? So the paper probably wouldn't withstand like painting on it, but it works just fine for graphite, probably for pen. I mean, it's a little soft. I can't do a ton of erasing on this paper because it is sort of cheap paper, but for four bucks, like, you know, I don't need to expect too much. Um, and so, yeah, this was a decent sketchbook, $4. I can fill it up, um, has a decent, you know, cover to it, this sort of 
craft paper. Um, and it even tells me what I need to do in the book. So that's kind of nice. All right, so something simple like that. Um, and for those of you who are even cheaper, these work great, actually. These composition notebooks. Now, you usually find them with lines in it, but that's okay. Just draw over the top of the lines. These are a dollar, right? Or a dollar fifty. So they're very inexpensive. The paper isn't great, but if you're hurting for cash, you know, you don't have to go out and spend 20 bucks for a sketchbook. You can spend a buck fifty and still continue drawing. Okay. So <clears throat> these are really great. Um, you can get them sometimes, you can find them with a grid paper, which might be easier to draw on. I and mean, those of you who like to make more technical drawings, that might be really helpful if you want to block out uh, graphic novels or something that you're working in. So don't discount the, the composition books because look, for a buck fifty, they're bound pretty well. They don't fall apart very easily. I mean, they can take a ton of abuse. Um, yeah, and you can get them in different colored covers and, and so on. Something to consider when buying a sketchbook is um, maybe color of paper. So you can buy sketchbooks with white paper, right? Um, paper choice is super important for you if you're going to be, you know, depending on how you're going to be working your sketchbook, um, th that paper choice is going to be critical. So if you're going to do a ton of painting, you might want to look for a sketchbook that has heavier weight paper. And so when you're in the art store, you're feeling the paper, testing how thick it is. You might be reading what the gram weight is or the pound weight of the paper is. The higher the number, the thicker the paper. So a 100 pound or 120 pound paper is thicker than an 80 pound paper is thicker than a 60 pound paper, right? So the thicker the paper, the more abuse it can take. Now, also texture, right? So if you feel the paper, if you like to work in pencil, but you pick up a sketchbook that's really smooth, um, you might have a, a little bit more of a problem with smearing, right? So that as you finish your drawings and close your book up, those drawings sort of smear all over each other because the um, graphite on the paper um, isn't like sunk down into the fibers of the paper. So it tends to smear and make a mess. So if that doesn't bother you, then no big deal. But if it does bother you, you're going to have to either spray fix every drawing you do in your sketchbook, right, with some spray fixative, or you might consider getting a sketchbook that has paper that's a little bit better with um, graphite. Now, like I said, if you're going to use ink or mixed media, which gets your paper wet quite a bit, um, that will affect um, your uh, paper choice. If you like these sort of thin, you know, Moleskine sketchbooks that have this very thin paper, just know that any marker work that you do on one side of the page bleeds through and appears on the other side of the page. So if that bothers you, um, then you'll probably just be either drawing on one page, right, and then never drawing on this second um, side of the spread, or you're just going to have to deal with stuff bleeding through and, and you know, that's kind of how you're going to work. So, you know, <clears throat> thinking about these things is super important. Um, the last thing that I haven't talked about, um, which I like to do oftentimes when I'm making uh, drawings, is this is my sketchbook now. Um, when I'm working at home or in my studio or in my office, it's just a large pad of paper that I bought, you know, just loose paper that I clip to a clipboard and then I just draw and when I finish a drawing, I just can unclip it and I store it in a big folder. Um, if I have, hold on. One folder. Sorry guys. So I just keep my sketchbook in a folder, right? So I would just take this drawing, add it to my folder and close it up. And then when I get enough pages, then I go down to the copy store and I have them bind them for me just with a flat perfect, bind. it's called perfect binding or flat binding. I just take them all of the pages. I take them cover paper. So I just bought, you know, from a, an online source or at a paper store, just the same size um, black cover stock. And then they, put them in a machine that sort of 
you know, arranges the paper nice and neat, and then it puts a, some cloth binding. And so now I keep all my sketches for all of my projects or for, you know, just my loose leaf drawings. And they're all together so I don't lose them, right? I'm, I tend to like lose them if they're in folders. But if they're bound in a sketchbook, then it's really nice. I've got them kept all together. And I just have like a, a drawer just full of these. And I actually like this better because here, here's another kind of weird thing about this. And we might, and we'll get to this in a few minutes, but maybe you don't like every drawing that you do. And so I can edit my sketchbook, right? I can only allow the drawings I want to keep in my sketchbook and the crummy drawings just get thrown in the trash. And so now when I show my sketchbook, boy, it just looks like I'm so good because every drawing is, is pretty decent in here. So, um, so this is a really simple um, solution for keeping a sketchbook. Instead of actually going and buying one, you just buy loose leaf paper, fill it out, and then that, it, it doesn't cost very much to have these uh, bound if you just go to your local copy store that does uh, binding, right? So, so those are options. Now, um, some of the other things that you might consider that we talked about is scale of sketchbook. So this obviously is different than this, is different than this, right? So each of these sketchbooks offers me something that the other one doesn't. This offers me size, and I can do a lot of drawing in here. I've got a lot of room, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of room to work. I've got, um, but it's not very portable, unless I have a huge bag, right? Um, and it's a little unwieldy if I'm sitting on a bus or sitting with a group of people to pull out this giant sketchbook and start drawing. So this one might not be so great. This one's a nice portable one. It fits in a bag, it doesn't fit in my pocket, but it works quite well for most applications for myself. So this is the one that I generally carry with me almost everywhere. However, again, there are times when neither one of those really work for me. And so having a teeny sketchbook Right, that I can just open up and work on, you know, small, that I can then put in my pocket with a pencil, and I always have a sketchbook with me. Maybe I'm going on a camping trip and I don't want to carry a ton of stuff with me, but I do want to take my sketchbook. This would be something that would work really great, right, um, in my backpack. So, um, scale of sketchbook, you know, paper, the kind of binding, all of those things, and what kind of drawings you're going to make in your sketchbook are really important. So. What kind of sketchbook should I use? Well, it all depends, right? And it depends on what you want to have happen. All right. So, so now I, let's go to um, question that I get number two, which is what should I draw with in my sketchbook? All right, well, it all depends, again, on what works best for you. Every tool has its limitations and the outcome of your drawing dictates the choices that you make for that outcome, right? So certain kinds of drawings require certain tools, right? And, and that sounds dumb to say that, but it really um, is something that we don't consider. We just sort of draw with whatever we have available, and that's fine too. However, if there are certain tools and techniques or things that you want to learn or get better at, then there are certain ways of drawing and certain items that you would choose that would make a difference in that um, sort of quest to make a certain kind of work. So I have um, graphite stuff, pencil stuff, pen stuff, markers, paints, you can collage, all of that. So let's just talk briefly about some of my favorite materials. These are uh, by no means um, an exhaustive list. I'll start with ink first here. Um, and no, I don't smoke uh, Monte Cristos. But I gotta tell you, if you go to a smoke shop and ask them if they have any old cigar boxes, and they usually sell them to you for a couple bucks. They're nice little wooden boxes. Oftentimes they have a little nail closure and they're great to store materials in. So, and they're cheap, right? Instead of buying a big plastic one, you get something with a cool label. And, and oftentimes they smell really good because they smell like tobacco and they've got a little cedar block in them. So these are great, by the way. Um, so what kind of, Pen tools work great in, in your sketchbook. Well, any of these, and this is a big right, list. Okay, so I'm gonna go through them. All right, uh, pilot gel pens, right? Gel pens work great. You get kind of nice thin lines. Um, 
This is great for detail work. This is great for making drawings that don't smudge or smear. Um, it, the ink dries quite rapidly. You can get them in different sizes, right? This is the C4 or the dot four. So this is a quite uh, narrow tip. Those work awesome. But maybe you just want a simple a Pilot G2. This is the 10. Um, it is a it is a fatter line, a little bit bolder line, but these are very convenient and quite inexpensive. Okay, um, you can do like I do. I really love sketching with a fountain pen. This is an inexpensive fountain pen. It's the Lamy Safari, L-A-M-Y Safari. So it is a fountain pen that I fill with my own fountain pen ink. So I screw the back off. It's got a piston filler, or you can buy little cartridges that you put in there. Um, you have to use fountain pen ink in fountain pens so that it doesn't clog up the feed and your nib. But these are great. I feel special always drawing with a fountain pen. So and you can buy flex nib fountain pens. This goes great anywhere I go, except in airplanes where you just have to be careful because when you get into a pressurized situation, they do leak. So that's the downside. Um, maybe you like brush pens. So brush pens, there's a whole bunch of options you know, when we go to brush pens. Um, these are the Pentel color brush. This whole thing is your cartridge of ink. It has kind of this weird reverse feed, so it actually draws ink from back here and sort of sucks it and then pushes it out the end, right? But these work wonderfully um, if you want to draw with a little bit bolder right, line as well as a thin line. These are actual brushes. So this is a little nylon brush with individual hairs. Um, and when this is empty, you just unscrew that, you buy a new cartridge, screw it back in and keep working with it. Um, there are people on YouTube that show you how to hack these where you can fill it up with your own ink and those work great. I will say um, the only downside to a Pentel color brush is um, it, the ink takes a little while to dry. And so if you're using a paper that is not very absorbent, um, you'll rub your hand over it and smear it quite easily. So just be aware of that. Um, and they come in different colors. So this is a brown one, that's a black one. They have red and yellow and all sorts of stuff. This is the Pentel pocket brush. Right? I love these. This is very portable. It's got a clip. It's really great to uh, take with you. Um, it has these sort of removable cartridges that once I'm finished with the cartridge, I just go get another one, snap it in, and continue drawing. Um, these are a little bit finer tip. Um, but they work really great. Um, I love these for inking things. Um, and, you know, they fit in your pocket. They're not as like, ridiculous. But look how big that thing is compared to this. It's just, it's just a lot bigger. So this one's nice. Um, if you don't like the actual brush ones, you can get brush pens that are like a marker. So that's like what this is. This is a lay pen, technical drawing pen. And this is the brush version. So it is like a marker. Um, I can still have that sort of flexibility in width. It's just not quite as fine. I can't get as fine a line as I can with the with the actual brush pens, like the Pentel um, brush pen. But um, these work great. They're, they're a little bit less expensive. Um, and I think you can get these usually. There are different brands that have them, and there are some companies that do them in uh, different colors. So these are quite nice. This is the B for bold. They have an F for fine and probably an M for medium. Okay. If you don't like uh, spending that kind of money, you can get yourself just something like this. This is a water brush. Right? They just are sold empty, um, normally used for watercolorists. So you just would fill it up with water, and then you can use like watercolor pencils. And then this, you can add water and sort of make your own painting. Um, or you can take it and fill it up with a mixture of ink and water or just ink. Um, the, the tips aren't quite as nice, um, but you can see I have like a light gray wash in here. So if I do an ink drawing and I want just a little gray shading, um, then that's what this is for. Um, so I really like uh, these for that purpose. Um, other pens, uh, kind of unusual pens. So this is, let me see if I've got one that's got ink in it. Okay. These are um, parallel pens. 
So a parallel pen is used for um, for calligraphy. Um, and so they have a broad, fat nib, nib. Okay, so they're meant to do like, you know, thick and thin lines to do your sort of, you know, your, your fonts, you know, and calligraphy. However, they're a lot of fun to draw with because you can draw very thin sort of line work and then add broad strokes as well. Sorry about the dog in the background, guys. There must be a dog outside. Um, but these are a lot of fun. It challenges you when you're drawing it um, to pay close attention, but it also sort of adds that, um, like this drawing could fail at any time, so I have to, you know, be on my guard. And and if you want to experiment, um, there's a guy named George Pratt who teaches at the Ringling School of uh, Art in Sarasota, Florida. He loves doing drawings with these. Um, he does some really interesting stuff. Um, and there are a lot of artists now who are using this, especially in the graphic novel comic book, um, that still hand draw their their work. And so the pit parallel pens, these are great. Um, paint markers are awesome. So there's a whole range of markers that you can get, right? You can get your standard sort of alcohol-based markers. This is just Blix version, um, but there are a whole bunch of brands, Copic and so on. Uh, these are awesome to use sometimes. This is like a, just a sh six shades of gray, um, but you can get them in full color. So on, uh, they are a little pricey. Um, these are the Uni Posca paint markers, right? Um, these are a lot of fun to work with. It, it is sort of an acrylic paint that dries rather quickly um, and can paint on just about everything. And you can get brush tips as well as sort of hard nibs. This is a brush tip one and you just sort of recharge it. You take this little thing off the back and you sort of pump it and it pumps the ink inside the pen into the nib and then you can, you know, paint with them. Oh, and I just touched something red. So now it's going to paint pink. Um, but these are a lot of fun to work with. So Posca pens. And if you get on, you know, any sort of social media site and just hashtag Posca um, and look at what people are doing with them, um, it's, they're pretty people are pretty creative and these are great pens to work with um if you like markers um the sort of graffiti industry has some amazing markers these are some of the best these are the crink markers you can get crink markers that drip um the amount of ink that sort of comes out of them is just ridiculous and it's kind of awesome this is an alcohol-based ink it is opaque it works great on cardboard and metal. Um, and you can draw on automobiles, on glass, all sorts of things. Um, but you know, these are really, these are uh, kind of expensive. This is the 70, the K71, which is one of the more popular ones. But these are a lot of fun to draw with. And you know, you think about always drawing inside your sketchbook. You could use some of these paint markers and draw on your sketchbook, right? You can decorate the covers with some of this stuff. So the crink markers are really great. These are sort of like the things that when you go to the art store, you're like, oh, that's a really expensive marker. I wonder what it would be like. Oh, what are they good for? So think of me as like telling you what they're good for. Okay, um, another uh, sort of a graffiti style marker is the Molotow. Um, this is an acrylic marker. These are all acrylic markers. This is Montana brand. This is Molotow brand. So this is a white, you know, paint basically in marker form. So it's a little bit more convenient. And so if you're working on dark paper, or let's say you're working with black, so this is a black marker, and it's got a, a rather large tip here. And I can do, I can do just these giant sort of things with it to fill a space in, whatever. Um, and it's by no means the widest one. I think this is one of their wider ones. So you can see how thick that is. It's like an inch, it's like an inch and a half. Um, these are a lot of fun to draw with. You just, you know, you don't want to sit there and color in a whole huge space on your, on your sketchbook. You might break out something like this um, to work with. And you can, once this is dry, it, just like acrylic paint, um, it uh, can be worked on top of. So you can get yourself things like these, the jelly rolls, right? So this is a gel pen, but in color, and it's an opaque um, jelly roll. So I can draw in white on top of black, um, and this just you know offers up a whole bunch of new possibilities in my sketchbook that I hadn't considered before, right? Like um, if you wanted to break uh, block in your lights and leave the background as your darks, right? It's kind of like that black velvet painting. The jelly rolls work the best. Um, Uniball makes one um, as well. 
Um, I don't think their nib is as good. It tends to skip a lot. Um, so I don't like these as much as I like the jelly rolls. And I think the jelly rolls are cheaper anyway. Um, last but not least is if you um, are kind of a purist, something like this. This is just a pen handle and a nib, right? So it's a separate little drawing nib. You would slip it into there and then you would buy yourself some nice ink. This is probably the best ink you can get right now. It's Dr. Martin's Black Star Waterproof India Ink. This is really great stuff. It's fun to draw with. Um, this is Sennelier, the French uh, paint manufacturer. This is their walnut ink. So this is um, made uh, with shellac and walnut um, stain. And this is, gives you kind of these beautiful brown drawings. So this is a lot of fun to use. Um, you can also, by the way, make your own inks. Um, and there are lots of recipes online. You could make your own walnut ink. So if you have access to a walnut tree, you just basically like boil the heck out of the hulls, the, the shell of the walnut, and it turns dark brown. And then you can bottle it. You might have to add a little something to it so it doesn't mold. Um, and then you can draw with homemade ink. So that's a lot of fun. Right, so um, dip pens are a really great way to draw with. And you can get bamboo pens, right, where the whole thing is made of a piece of bamboo and they're sort of clipped so that you can draw with. So there are lots of sort of variations on this, but these are a load of fun to draw with. Once you put the stuff down, like if you're like me, right, you buy something, you try it, you get excited, you draw with it for a while, you try something else. And, so those are just that's just the pens. Oh my gosh, what else do we? What else can I possibly show? Well, um, let's talk about graphite here. Um, you know, you've got to have to number one get yourself a decent pencil sharpener. I think these are awesome. These are the Blackwing two-step pencil sharpeners. It gives you an extra long tip. Um, it's nice when you know buying, and I tell my drawing one students, it's nice to have a, uh, a portable pencil sharpener that captures all the pencil shavings so that they don't, it doesn't get everywhere. Um, but this one makes some nice uh, points and, and works really well. So you've got to have a decent pencil sharpener, but you know these work great as well. Just the simple two-hole pencil sharpeners. Now um, you can get just regular you know, number two pencils which um, if you recall, uh, maybe back to drawing one, just a Ticonderoga number two pencil is an HB pencil. It gives you the best flexibility. You can buy them in big boxes of you know, 25 or 26 or 32 or 48 at like Office Depot. Um, and you can go through a ton of these. They work awesome. And so if you like drawing graphite and you don't spend a ton of money, this will get you by, right? And they're cheap. However, if you want to go to the Cadillac of pencils, you go to this. This is the Palomino Blackwing. So you can see it's got a slightly different um, eraser. You can actually change out the eraser. So if you're making a lot of mistakes, you can just pull the eraser out, replace the eraser, slide it back in. Um, and the, the graphite in these is a little bit softer. It's a ho much higher quality graphite, um, which gives you a really kind of wonderful, like, writing and drawing experience. I don't know how to explain it. It's just like butter, as we say. So um, and they make different versions. So this is like the back Blackwing Pearl. This is their original Blackwing. And I think there are two or three other sort of pencils in the um, in their sort of lineup. But these are awesome pencils. Um, you can work with sort of woodless pencils, right? So maybe you've seen these. This is just a pencil that has no wood. It's just all graphite, which is great if you want to make marks right, that are a little bit wider than what your normal um, pencil would give you. So I can do that with this kind of a pencil. I can't, even with it sharpened way out, I can't quite get as big of a mark. And so it just, again, offers flexibility. The problem with a lot of graphite um, pencils that are woodless is that they are a bit of a mess. These usually come wrapped in sort of shrink wrap plastic, but that um, comes off. Um, and so, but maybe you want it off because then you can use the whole side of the pencil. And I love these. These are the Lyra graphite crayons, right? And this is a 9B, which is uber soft. 
But these, um, I think, are a lot of fun to draw with. Um, it just keeps me from getting too finicky with my drawings. So a nice blunt tool. You know, I can only draw big, fat, chunky lines. But these are really great. Um, colored pencils, I'm sure you all have looked at and wanted all of the giant sets of Prismacolors. Just know that Prismacolors are a wax-based uh, pencil. And so what you draw, you cannot erase, or it, it's very difficult to. So, but, you know, it offers you a whole bunch of colors, and they're a lot of fun, and they work great with markers, things like that. Uh, something that you might consider buying, um, if you're going to spend so much money on a, a, a pencil, um, you might, when it gets too short and difficult to hold, you might consider getting yourself a pencil extender. So that's what this is, and that's what this is. These are sort of two different variations. This one has just sort of a, a loose clamp. I don't like these as much because the pencil rattles in it just a little bit, but now it's comfortable for my big hands. Um, or I can use one like this. It's got these like teeth and a, something I can just sort of spin and spin and spin until it locks in. And it's a little bit more comfortable. And so the Derwent ones are really nice because they've got slightly rubberized handle. But if you don't want to spend that much money, um, these come in like a pack of four on Amazon and work really great. Uh, and I think it was like seven bucks. And I got like four or five of them in a package. I mean, these work for most pencils. The problem is some, some pencils don't fit. Um, so if the pencil has like a little metal thing, you know, it's... I can't get it in there, right? So it only works for pencils that are sort of open-ended like this, or maybe if you buy, you know, traditional art graphic pencils, then those fit in there and these, these tend to work. I will say something else that's really great about these is let's say you sharpen it real nice and you're just going to go and you're going to be gone for a little while. You're waiting in the car for someone. Um, you can take your pencil and like put it in your pocket with the tip inside the handle so it doesn't stab you in the leg when it's in your pocket as you get in and out of the car. So it, that's kind of a nice little feature and um, just keep, protects the tips of your pencils. And mine would always get broken in my pocket, so that's kind of nice. Now, obviously, um, you know, things like this, uh, just a mechanical pencil is really great. The trouble with mechanical pencils is you only get one kind of line and so if, um, if you want a variety of line and make a more interesting drawing, uh, having that flexibility to go from thin to thick is, is kind of nice, right? So that if I can do little thin lines, but also turn and do some shading with the side of the pencil, or you know, even have it you know, switch while I'm drawing um, is, you know, is like an option with this pencil that I do not have with this pencil. Or you do what I do, you just have a couple of these pencils together um, in your drawing bag. And then, you know, if you want to do a little tight noodly stuff, then you can use this one. If you don't, you can use this one. Um, Lyra also makes this is really kind of cool. This is a water soluble graphite pencil. So you can actually do a drawing. It works just like graphite. It looks like graphite. Then you can take water to it and turn it into a watercolor. Um, and it, or you can wet the paper and draw with it, and it draws completely different. So these are a lot of fun to try. Um, and they, again, they make them in different hardnesses. And I know that the UBU bookstore sells these, so they're great. Or you can buy them online. Now, whatever you do, make sure you have good erasers, right? Uh, pink pearl erasers are the worst ones you can get because they stain your paper pink. Gum erasers are great. Um, Uh, these stick erasers are awesome, right? So these are white vinyl erasers, sort of working like a mechanical pencil, and you can get refills for these. This is a slightly thicker one, so these work awesome. And then they, you know, they just store themselves nicely in a in a little pencil bag. By the way, if you haven't thought about it, right, uh, having a pencil bag is really nice because again, it protects all of your tools, keeps them all together in one place, and you know you can get a variety of sizes. Or if you, you know, if you're crazy like me. Um, you, know, you can go with something like from Ikea or from the art supply store, or you can get online and find like um, persimmon dyed Japanese handmade uh, pencil cases, um, and they're a lot of fun. So that is graphite. Uh, colored pencils, pens, okay, we've gone over, markers we've gone over, paint, 
um, paint, just about any paint works great in a sketchbook. You can use acrylic paints because water, any water-based paints work great in sketchbooks because they dry quickly and they tend to not transfer onto other pages. Obviously, if you're going to work in oil, that makes a mess on the other page, so you have to wait till your paint dries, right? But a lot of people do beautiful oil paintings in sketchbooks. They just have to leave their sketchbook open for a day or two till the paint tacks up. Um, and if it's any, if it's thick, and you close the book um, after it's dried, sometimes it tacks to the other side of the paper and, and it creates a problem. So I always sort of suggest to students to get themselves some gouache, uh, which is an opaque watercolor. It works really great. Regular watercolors work really great. Acrylic gouache works awesome in sketchbooks because all of them dry rather quickly. So you can sit down, maybe you only have 15 minutes or half an hour to make a little painting and you can be set up painting and then you know, taking down and then moving on rather quickly, and you can close your book and not have it uh, make a mess. So paints work really great. Just remember that you need a sort of a, a, a nice thick paper. Um, and uh, yeah, they also make, you know, as you probably have seen, you know, these really wonderful sort of portable um, watercolor kits that you can take with you, little pan kits, uh, little metal ones that have a brush that sort of breaks down the handle from the from the ferrule of the brush and you can sort of transport them in a backpack or whatever. So those work really great. Um, something that a lot of people don't consider uh, as really good materials is just something simple like craft knives and glue sticks, right? So a sketchbook doesn't have to be just filled with drawings. Sketchbook can be filled with um, mixed media sort of things. So you can mix your inks and your paints and your pencils, but you can also collage. So sometimes having just a decent craft knife that's nice and sharp and a glue stick, right? And then you can paste, uh, you, you might do a drawing in a, you know, on a loose sheet of paper that you wanna paste into your sketchbook. Um, so these uh, things work really wonderful. Now, there are some other unusual materials that I don't sort of have out here except for one. And that is, um, okay, so you can use spray paint in sketchbooks. That works really cool. Uh, you can use ink brayers, which are kind of the things they're like rollers that you roll up ink for printing, printmaking. You can sew in your sketchbook, right? So people have gone in and sewn pages. That's kind of cool. You can relief print in it. So you can make stamps or wood blocks or linoleum cuts. You can make your own tools and draw with your, in your sketchbook. So like you don't, you're not limited to just what you can buy you can sit down and go outside and take a twig and cut it and, and make your own pens, right? So those are all sort of cool options. Now, the last one I do wanna show you, which I think is kind of nifty, is this thing, and this is a blender marker. So let's say um, I have my sketchbook. Let's see where we put my sketchbook. So this is a photocopy or a laser print. It has to be a laser toner or photocopy toner. It can't be an inkjet um, that I just sort of printed and cut out. And, and you can do this transfer method where let's say on a page of my sketchbook, I can take this sort of head and I'm going to need, this is a bone folder, but you could use the back of a spoon. So this is a xylene based marker. So when you sniff them, um, it is uh, pretty stinky. Um, if I hold this down and I saturate the back of um, this printout, I'm just gonna, I won't do the whole thing because it'll take a ton of time. But if I just saturate it, make sure that the paper gets nice. And you can also, by the way, do this with nail polish remover. Right, which is acetone. Um, so I saturate it and then I take my burnishing tool and I can't move my photocopy. If I just burnish it down, what that stuff does is it dissolves the toner. Let's see if this worked. Yeah, so if I lift it up, it transfers the Xerox copy down to my sketchbook. So if you were into collaging, or what I like to do is, is something called um, priming, sketchbook priming, which means that you sort of prep your sketchbook. You don't know what you're gonna draw. 
So you just sort of mark up all the pages so that they, um, so that you don't, you know, are confronted with a blank white sheet of paper and you're like, oh, what do I draw? You've already messed up your sketchbook and then you just come in and just sort of have fun with it. But now I've got like, you know, a little bit of a, uh, a drawing or print or something that I can then work with and turn it into something interesting. So they do stink a lot though, like when I snip this, it, I want to use it in a well ventilated area, um, but that's kind of cool. And then I can just sort of work with that, right? So transfer methods, you know, really cool. And that's just done again with a blender marker. Okay, so this chart this is a chart pack brand, P-A-K, so C-H-A-R-T-P-A-K, chart pack. Um, and, you know, this could, there are tons of creative opportunities or possibilities just with doing this. Let's say you do a drawing of a body, you can sort of play like uh, sort of dress up dolls, you know, where you do a figure and then you, you know, photocopy it and then you just transfer that figure over and over and over again. And then you just color different, you know, clothing or whatever into it. All right, there's so many things you can do with that. So kind of cool. So that's an unusual, um, unusual item. Now, um, so I've gone through what kind of sketchbook should I use? What should I draw with? So the next two items are really things that um, are sort of dependent on you, right? So number one is how often should I be drawing in my sketchbook? Um, that is the question of the century, right? Well, what works best for you? Um, balanced against how bad do you want to get better? Um, how bad do you want to get better as an artist? How bad do you want to improve on a certain tool or technique? Um, how bad do you want to be a creative person, right? Is this something that is important to you or is it not? Are there other things that take precedence? So, um, so you have to sort of make that decision, but I think it is important to establish some sort of regular routine. Um, and I think the most would be that if you uh, work regularly, maybe daily, um, that is probably the most beneficial to you because it is a regular, you know, like every hour might be a little ridiculous, but if you just spent time, maybe even as little as 15 minutes a day sketching in your sketchbook, that will go a long way. If let's say, you know, after a week, you've done 15 minutes. So what is that? 15 times four or so you've drawn almost two hours in your sketchbook. If you draw 15 minutes a day for one week. Um, and that's a lot of time that, you know, two hours, with a sketching, you probably have 10 or 15 pages filled up. Um, so a regular routine daily, if you can. Um, number two, I think that's super important for you is to think about um, taking your sketchbook with you everywhere you go. So um, portability, right, becomes important. Um, if you don't have your sketchbook and you find yourself waiting in line, um, that's a great opportunity to draw. Um, if you're just standing there looking at your phone, well, um, that's probably fine too. Maybe you're communicating with people, but wouldn't it be better if you spent that 15 minutes in, in the subway line or in the drive-through at uh, in and out And you know, when your car is just sitting there paused, that you have a little sketchbook and you're just doodling, um, working on something. So having a sketchbook, having a simple, you know, decent size, like this is my setup, I just take this with me everywhere I go, and I take my um, I take this with me everywhere I go, and it's always in my bag. Or if I'm stepping out, um, look, I've got a number of tools that I can use. And I've got a decent sized sketchbook I can draw with. It fits in the side panel of my car door, um, and I always have my sketchbook. So, and I might not draw in it, right? But I have that option, even when I go to like family dinners or whatever, um, even while people are talking, you can be drawing while they are talking, right? So um, you can be a part of the conversation, but also be drawing. Um, think of your sketchbook as working like a musician would practice their instrument, right? So maybe you do already play an instrument and you know, or maybe you think back to piano lessons with mom, you know, standing over you, reminding you that you needed to practice every day. Um, think of your sketchbook routine as something like a musician and that the more you draw, the more time, right? That sort of Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 of sort of, uh, hours that are dedicated towards improvement, will go a long way in you becoming better and more satisfied with your artistic career and your art 
your sort of technical abilities. So um, you just have to sort of set a goal. Uh, maybe uh, you give yourself pages per week or pages per day. Um, there are sort of online um, challenges. You can buy these sort of super thick sketchbooks that have like 600 pages and people will do these challenges where you have to fill the sketchbook within a month, right? So you just do you know a ton of drawing. You can give yourself that kind of experience. Um, it might be worth it, it might not be. Maybe not the 600 page sketchbook, but think if you made one of these little sketchbooks and just said, I'm gonna fill one of these out today, right? Um, there aren't a ton of pages. I think there's like 32 actual pages, so it's 16, 16 actual sheets, um, 32 sides. If you just sat down and said, I'm going to finish one of these in a day and just see what happens, right? Um, that might be fun to do on a, you know, during spring break or on, during the summer, um, you know, on a Sunday, maybe when you're not working, um, on a day off, whatever. Um, so, you know, give yourself a challenge and see what happens. Maybe uh, I have a lot of friends who will fill sketchbooks every month. Um, and so they're usually doing 10 to 12 sketchbooks a year. They're drawing a ton, um, but it's important to them, right? And it's like their sort of place where they can do whatever and enjoy themselves drawing. And it's not sort of assignment based. It's just for the pure enjoyment of drawing. So how often? I think daily is important. Um, but whatever works for you and make sure that you give yourself the best opportunity to make work um, by set, you know, having it with you at all times, having your sketchbook and something to draw with, you know, even if it's just a pencil, right? That's not hard to carry around something like this and a mechanical pencil or a pen, then you're always, you know, prepared to go on. All right, last question that I, and then um, hopefully I'll have um, a little bit of time left to uh, field some questions. I'm hoping maybe about a half an hour. So what should I fill my sketchbook with? So what kind of drawings? Well, for most of you, this might not be a problem, right? That you already know what you want to do. Maybe you're in a class where people are saying, you know, like your teacher saying, well, I need these things to occur in your sketchbook. So you've been given assignments, right? Um, a, a common question that I get from students is when I submit my sketchbook for the BFA, what are what are the faculty looking for in my sketchbook? Like, why am I submitting the sketchbook, right? So why, why is that as important as maybe um, the finished pieces, you know, my portfolio pieces, why would a sketchbook be important? Um, so when I look at student sketchbooks or when I look at anybody's sketchbook, really, there are uh, sort of three things that I'm looking for. Number one is sort of honesty in their sketchbook, right? So these are the drawings that I like to make. These are the drawings that I, you know, sort of reflect who I am as a person, what my interests are, right? So maybe I'm into manga. And so I've got like manga style characters and that tells me a little bit about you. Maybe I've got a lot of sort of Disney princess, you know, kind of drawings. Maybe I have a lot of drawings in certain sorts of materials that just feel good to me that I enjoy uh, drawing with. So honesty is number one. So never fill a sketchbook with things that, you know, well, so-and-so makes these kinds of drawings. That must mean that I have to make those kinds of drawings. So that's like the worst thing you can do for yourself because it might just sort of make you not like to draw, right? Because you'll discover, I really hate these materials or I hate this kind of drawing, you know, but that guy's popular, famous, um, and so I should be drawing that, but I'm really not enjoying it. So you have to ignore all that and just say, okay, the sketchbook is where I can honestly make the kind of drawings that I want to make. Number two, I look for exploration. So are you using your sketchbook as a place to explore and grow as an artist, right? So are you trying new things? Are you taking what you would normally sort of go back to over and over and over again? You know, are you adding a new twist? Are you making drawings that are more complicated? Now, I always draw trees, but maybe I'm going to push myself for the next two weeks and I'm going to draw automobiles, right? And so you're, you're sort of challenging yourself with more difficult things to draw than what you've always drawn. So I look for, so number one is honesty, number two is exploration. You know, and it could be also in materials, all sorts of things. Uh, and the last thing is dedication to craft, right? So if if you are a student that's applying for the BFA program and you turn in a sketchbook that only has five or six pages filled, um, I question your um, commitment 
But if you turn in like, oh, I've, you know, I've got three sketchbooks, which one should I, you know, they're all filled, which one should I turn in? Then I'm like, oh, okay, this person likes to draw. So I'm, I'm a little bit more um, hopeful for you because you are a person that really wants to work on this and you're dedicated to making this happen. Um, so think about that, you know, in regards to your own sort of sketching practice. Are you drawing the drawings that you like to make? Are you exploring and sort of pushing yourself? And how much are you drawing, right? Which was sort of that last question that I talked about. Now, what is the purpose of keeping a, ske keeping a sketchbook for you? Um, is it practice? Right, so I'm going to write these out here on my little paper. So, are you drawing to practice? Right, practicing the things like figure drawing. Okay, are you using your sketchbook to explore? Right, so these are like. Um, sort of directions that you can take with your sketchbook. If it is something that you're practicing, right, then that sort of lends itself to certain kinds of drawings. And if it's practice, you're going to do some crummy drawings in there. And that's OK, because your sketchbook is a personal place for you to grow. If it's a place for you to explore, right, to try new things, to test things out, what happens if I cut the, pa the page up a little bit, right? And what happens if I completely cover a page in black paint and then draw on top of it, what happens, right? So that's, again, that's a risky behavior in a sketchbook, but will, um, you know, turn something out some really interesting things later. But you also might do some duds and some terrible drawings. You've got to be OK with that. The last um, thing I think is, is the sketchbook a work of art in and of itself? So um, a lot of artists, if you get online and look at artists like James Jean, um, those guys, fill a sketchbook and then go scan the whole sketchbook and then print their sketchbook and sell you that, a copy of their sketchbook, right? And so every page is a sort of beautiful drawing. There's nothing wrong with that, um, but it can sort of maybe um, hamper you from practicing and exploring, right? Uh, as a student, uh, me and my classmates had this sort of bad habit of sharing sketchbooks with each other. And what that did was that meant that every drawing you did in your sketchbook had to be awesome. And it put on unneeded pressure. It just sort of told you, I have to do every drawing great. And if it's terrible, then I feel bad about myself. Well, that's a terrible way to approach sketching, right? A sketchbook should be filled with lots of terrible drawings, and that's better for you. All right, keep um, the following things in mind. Um, your sketchbook is for you to explore, not necessarily to show off, okay? Just like I was saying. So if you make a bad drawing, no big deal, right? You just turn the page, you start again, right? And if you don't have bad drawings in your sketchbook, you're probably not doing it right. Number two, um, draw from life. Okay, this is super important. Think of your sketchbook as kind of like a visual diary. So what can I draw if I'm drawing from life? I don't know. Draw what you eat. Draw who you know. Draw where you go. What you love. What you hate. Where you live. Draw what you look like. Draw your pets. Right. Draw your vacation. Instead of taking all these uh, pictures on your phone, you know, spend half the time making drawings of where you're at. Right. Um, draw from the inside of any public transportation. Uh, if you're not driving the car, why don't you draw the other person while they are driving the car? Draw outdoors, draw indoors, right? Like draw from the world around you. Draw your personal experience and your view of that, you know, world. Um, that is a great thing and is probably one of the best things you can do to fill your sketchbook. It also helps you. It's both sort of a response to your world, but it is also a way to practice and explore, right? Those two things that you need to think about. Okay, if those don't, you know, excite you, uh, another thing you can draw from is your imagination. So drawing things that are, you know, real like centaurs and unicorns and fairies and like sci-fi fantasy stuff, worlds that, you know, don't exist in this, you know, in our world, like that is a great place to, you know, create stuff. Draw from, drawing from your imagination also doesn't have to be directed towards like, some sort of narrative content like sci-fi fantasy, it can just be design, right? So it can be 
exploring and drawing, you know, circles and dots and squares and combinations of those and creating interesting patterns and that is drawing from your imagination. Um, have a go, uh, have a go to drawing when you get stuck. So sometimes you open your sketchbook and you don't know what to draw. And um, I have a go to draw and I fill my sketchbooks with. And I, you will see if I go through this sketchbook, you know, if I went page and page and page and page and page, um, one of my, I'm stuck, I don't know what to draw, is this. I draw skulls all the time because it's something that I'm familiar with and it can get me jump started. So I can do this drawing and then go, okay, I got the nerves out. Now I'll break out my pen and do little figures or whatever. But, you know, if you were to scroll through most of my sketchbooks, I mean, there's one page, right? Just drawing skulls over and over again, which kind of led me to like, oh, okay, I can go find some images and draw. So having a go-to image, just something that you love to draw, don't get stuck there, you know, draw it for a little while and then get going. So I, that's a great way to just sort of jumpstart, you know, uh, your work. Um, try new media. So I showed you all of the graphite and pencil and colored pencil, watercolors and inks and all the stuff that you can try. Maybe just saying, okay, I always use ballpoint pen in my sketchbooks. Maybe I'm going to try markers and just draw for a while in markers. So mixing up materials will lead towards uh, lots of great creativity. Um, good drawings, I will say, necessarily don't take a long time. So don't worry. If you do a drawing that takes you 30 seconds or a minute and it fills your whole page, that's okay. You can turn the page and maybe your next drawing took you three days. Um, that's okay too. So just know that time isn't necessarily an important factor. The other idea of having a finished drawing is like, when is it finished? You know, I can't remember what artist said, good art is never finished, it's only abandoned, right? So at some point, you can just abandon your drawing and go on. So things will never be finished. And you can, in fact, and things that I did in this sketchbook, you know, I did a pen drawing, but then I came back three days later with um, some watercolor markers and some other things and just continue drawing on the top of a drawing that I previously worked on. So, you know, are they ever finished? Sometimes you do a drawing. I know that in this sketchbook, I did some really bad drawings and I was embarrassed. Like I hated it. And it kept like, every time I turned to the page, I'd see this sort of stupid drawing. So, oh, okay, I'll just draw a rectangle over it, cover it up, right? And then I can draw something else, you know, on the other page and just sort of let it be an item. And I might come back sometime later and maybe with gel pen, Right, I can do uh, some work on it. So, you know, I did that a lot in the sketchbook and it made me feel better about my sketchbook. And, you know, it was like, oh, I just have to creatively deal with that. And if it's terrible, just cover it up and do something else and move on. So don't stress, right? Um, you might want to copy other artists as a way to sort of try something new, right? So have a Pinterest board where it's drawings of other artists and sort of it's like trying on a hat. Right, let me try on this guy's hat, see how it works. What does it feel like to draw like them? Do I like it? And then you go back to your drawing and maybe you've incorporated some of the things that they do into your own techniques and you'll end up really enjoying, you know, your new drawings. Um, try practicing something that you'd like to improve, right? So if you're having a hard time drawing hands or ears or dogs or whatever, then make it a point to fill a page with that. There is an artist that I really like um, who teaches at the College of Creative Studies in Detroit, and he would, at every morning um, before he started his freelance work, he would fill a page with 100 of something. So it would be like 100 automobiles, 100 buses, 100 hands, 100 apples, 100 bananas. Like, it didn't matter, but it, it just sort of forced him into sort of a, a, a like, it was like having a, a routine that he drew something that he was unfamiliar with. And by the hundredth one, you know, he kind of was starting to get the idea of how he could then use that in his uh, creative work. So thinking about practicing something. Um, sometimes including a written element in your sketchbook can help you later identify what your goals were in the drawing, or you can use your drawings as like illustrations of some sort of daily journal. So you might, you know, as you're drawing, I don't do this very much in my personal sketchbooks, but, you know, taking notes in your uh, 
like an art history class and then doing little drawings of those paintings that you're looking at in the slides will number one, keep you awake. And number two, will allow you to sort of better um, sort of in incorporate into your brain visually some of the stuff you're learning, right? So it can be illustrations of the text that you're, the notes that you're taking. Or um, maybe you do keep a, a journal every day and you talk about your thoughts and feelings, and then you can draw that. There's a, there's a big practice in Japan of doing that. You know, they make these really kind of wonderful um, sort of daily journals and, you know, you, they have pens and they have little templates and all sorts of things. So people will draw what they eat for every meal. Um, it's kind of a fun way to keep a journal is to not only write it, you know, the daily stuff that you have to do, but draw it as well. So that's kind of fun. Um, and you can also, like those of you who are graphic designers, you know, things like practicing hand lettering, all of that is a great way to fill a sketchbook, right? Designing fonts, stuff like that. Um, a great uh, resource for drawing is a prompt list. So if there are things that, um, you know, you're like stuck, I don't know what to draw. Well, like the month of October, they have something that was started by Jake Parker called Inktober, which challenges uh, creative people across the world to do one ink drawing every day and post it on social media. So you can use these drawing lists. Now, October has a ton of them. There's like Drawloween in Inktober, but other months of the year, have these drawing challenges as well. So like March coming up is March of the Robots. And so it's drawing a robot every day, you know, for the month of March and posting it on social media, hashtag March of the Robots. May, there's one called Mermay, right? So it's mermaids every day uh, for the month of May. So those are really fun to do. Or you can um, create your own sort of drawing challenges where Let's say you just sort of uh, do a bunch of word lists of characters, word lists of actions, and um, word lists of descriptions, and you cut them up and you sort of draw them out of a hat, you know, character, um, you know, like what they're wearing and what they're doing. And then you look at, you put those together and then you try and make a drawing based on the stuff that you have just uh, written, right? So you're all of a sudden given kind of an assignment that you're trying to complete, right? Or, you know, go buy a bag of fortune cookies and open them up and draw the fortune that's found inside the fortune cookie. And then you get to enjoy the cookie and have a fun drawing challenge, right? Um, you can get together with friends or other people and form sketch clubs um, where you challenge each other, you know, let's go to the mall and let's draw the food court. So everybody's got the same sort of challenge and you're doing it all together at one time while you're eating your Chick-fil-A, right? So. That's a, a really great way to sort of fill a sketchbook is doing it with other people. Um, and you can do it virtually even, you know, just sort of set up a Google chat. Everybody logs in, you know, hey, what are we drawing tonight? There are also sort of like the Society of Illustrators sponsors figure drawing. Um, and I can't remember what day it is, but it's it costs not very much. You log in, they have a live model um, that are usually costumed. There's a bunch of other illustrators there. And then they, you know, you submit your drawings and post them and it's a lot of fun. So um, you might want to play games like The Exquisite Corpse, which was a game that was sort of uh, done by the Surrealists. And if you're not familiar with The Exquisite Corpse, it's just like you fold up paper, like, you know, accordion style. Now, once I tell you this, you're like, oh yeah, I played this. Um, and you say, okay, first person draws the head, right? And they make something really weird. And then you fold it over and all they see are two little lines of where the neck is. And then you hand that paper to them and they draw the body and so on down the line. And then when you open it up, you have this sort of weird character. So it's kind of an interactive, fun sketching thing that you can do. Um, so drawing with other people is really great. Um, lastly, um, two final things, uh, ideas on what to draw. Uh, check out what other people have done. Look at their sketchbooks for inspiration. So having a um, sort of a Pinterest board or searching social media hashtag sketchbook and just see what other people are drawing in their sketchbooks, right? You might be inspired to try something or hey, let me, like I mentioned earlier, you know, finding other artists that you admire and copying their style for a little while, right? The internet and social media are full of great examples of sketchbooks. They're also full of really terrible examples, right? So you do have to sort of sift through a lot of stuff. And the other thing you have to be really careful of 
is that you don't spend all your time just looking at other people's work and not sketching yourself. So make sure that you um, take the, you know, maybe set a time limit and say, hey, for 10 minutes, I'm going to research sketchbooks on Pinterest, and then I'm going to get drawing myself for the next 20 minutes. So it's half an hour. I, you know, I feel pretty decent about that. But, you know, social media can be uh, just super distracting and it might take us away from, you know, the goal of filling our sketchbooks. Lastly, I think a really great motivator is sharing what you've done on social media. So whether you have a personal website that has like a blog um, or daily sort of update section, or you've got an Instagram or you've got Twitter um, or whatever, um, Snapchat, I mean, do people even use Snapchat anymore? I, I don't even know. But uh, you can do a drawing, challenge yourself to do a drawing and post once a week. Um, people love to see process stuff. Um, people want to interact with you and talk to you about your work. Your friends that you are following are doing it, you can too. So, you know, just hashtag it. You might get new followers. You might discover new friends, you know, all over the world. And, you know, if you really get into it, then you can start making YouTube videos. And then, you know, you get lots of interesting feedback. And, um, and your sketchbook can, you know, take on a life of its own, not only as maybe something that you are practicing and exploring, but something that you're sharing with others. So that uh, can be a good thing at some point, right? All right, so I've just gone through our four main points. What kind of sketchbook should I use? Wait, before I maybe do a, a summary, now is the time, if you have a question or comment, please include it in the live event Q&A, and then I will switch over to you can see my lovely face and then we will um i will answer your question so if you have a question right now is a great time because there's this 30 second delay um i don't want there to be an awkward 30 second pause so while i'm reviewing please submit your questions now so we talked today about um what kind of sketchbook I, mean, I showed you a whole bunch of options talked about what should i draw with in my sketchbook we looked at a ton of options how often should I be drawing in my sketchbook? And we talked about that, right? A little bit about maybe some sort of routine, um, having you know easy accessibility to your sketchbook at all times. And then lastly, we talked about maybe some options of what you might fill in your sketchbook. So with that being said, I am going to now look at the Q&A. Um, there's a lot of new questions here. Let's see, scroll down. And I will publish, um, let's see, all right, so I'm going to, give me a second, I'm going to change cameras, and then, so I, it might go dark, but I will be right back, hold on. All right, so I'm going to publish a few of these questions and then we're going to talk about them. So lots of good questions. Okay, um, let's see here. What's, uh, where specifically do you go to get your paper bound into a sketchbook? Um, so I go to like the FedEx Kinkos or um, in Utah, Alpha Graphics is a good sort of copy store. Um, I've taken uh, stuff, I have a Alpha Graphics like within a mile of my home um, and I just take my stacks in there and say, here, bind these. I, they sort of show me the options. They can do like wire bound um, they can do that. I like the perfect binding. Um, but I, I thought that that worked out really well um, and was super easy peasy. So um, Alpha Graphics uh, locally is a great place to do that. Um, uh, is this going to be recorded? It is recorded. I don't know if Natalie's still here, but I, I think this is being recorded. Um, what happened to some of these? Let's see, published, oh, here we go. Um, are social media challenges appropriate? Um, absolutely. Um, I think 
one of the things about uh, social media drawing challenges is that just that it um, is sort of an external pressure to make a drawing. And so maybe you need a little bit of motivation and you're like, I'm not drawing enough. Um, this might be a great way to sort of, you know, challenge myself to draw every day and to, um, you know, as long as it's not um, overtaking other important, you know, activities that you're supposed to be doing. I always cringe a little bit when uh, students should be painting in my class, but they're working on their Inktober. And um, so I think like, don't do that. Don't, um, you know, if you're supposed to be doing something else, do that other thing and then just, you know, maybe stay up an extra half hour during the day, you know, and, and work it into your schedule. Um, and, but I think they're really great. There's a, a lady, um, an illustrator who lives in Portland, Carson Ellis, and she does this thing called Trans Mundane Tuesdays, where she offers a drawing challenge that a lot of people sort of post to. And for a while, she's doing it like, you know, posting every day, all the responses, but she found that it would like became overwhelming, like the response. And so she had to, you know, sort of limit even her sort of reaction to her own drawing challenge that she was offering to people because she was like, I don't want to make this a career um, of just looking at everybody else's drawings. I want to draw as well. So um, just, yeah, you just kind of have to take priorities. But I think um, I think drawing challenges are a lot of fun to do. So um, try it out, you know, and maybe it's not for you. Like some people stress out about it and then they only do four and then they abandon it because they feel terrible, terrible about themselves. Like again, it's like you know, no puppies will die if you don't finish the whole month of uh, Inktober. It'll be okay. Is scrapbooking doodles and sketches appropriate? Absolutely. Like there is nothing wrong with um, that kind of stuff, right? I, I actually like some of the stuff that is now available to us because of scrapbooking. Right there are cool like um, punches and stuff that you can do to your paper. There's lots of great inking opportunities. There's really cool pens. Um, there's like washi tape and all of that stuff that has sort of exploded. There's interesting papers. Um, I made a whole bunch of these little sketchbooks a little while back um, and they, you know, half of the covers on them were made from leftover scrapbooking paper that my daughter had. And so I was like, oh, cool. I'm just going to steal a couple sheets of this um, and make little sketchbooks. And because it was cool paper and it was heavy duty, and I was like, awesome. So yeah, doodles, uh, doodling in a sketchbook, like that Zentangle and all that stuff, absolutely. Like that's part of sketching. And you should never feel bad that that's the kind of stuff you like to draw. Right? So that kind of stuff is great. Um, if you like to sketch digitally, would you print it out and bind it? Or do you like a digital sketchbook? That's a great question. Um, yeah, well, it depends, you know, on, I like an actual physical thing. Like, I like having a book. And so, like, I can put it on the shelf. I can take it off and show people easily. So I'm kind of, I love, like, this as an option. Um, some people don't like it. Um, the, the, the bad thing about working digitally, like on your iPad, is in Procreate, it's just a bunch of files. It's ones and zeros, and it doesn't actually exist in a real space, right? It's, in virtu it's your virtual sketchbook. Um, but that's okay, right? You, you know, with storage capabilities now, you can, you can have cloud storage, and you can put all your images and drawings there to save for later. Um, and that's perfectly fine. But that's a great idea to actually maybe print it out and bind it. Maybe you want to go through and have sketchbooks that are theme based, right? So all of your drawings of, um, of cats doing crazy things, you know, you could you could sort of select out of all of your drawings. And again, it's like an editing process, like the sketchbook that I showed you. You know, I have folders of drawings, just folders, you know, of drawings. And some of them are good and some of them are dumb. And the dumb ones I can edit, I can just throw away, and then only the good ones get bound, right? So that might be a great way to keep a sketchbook. And if you have to present a sketchbook, let's say uh, if you're applying to a BFA program, um, they'll want maybe a physical copy, or maybe they want, you know, scans of your sketchbook. Um, and you, you, you know, bypassed a step, you've got everything sort of uh, done digitally. So that might work great for you. Um, question, what ink medium is your favorite? Um, so I am a big fan 
There's Martin Fox. Oh, it's not here. Sorry, it's a mess. I am a sucker for these brush pens. I really love working with these two brush pens along with this ridiculously fat marker. And then I usually have like a gel pen or my fountain pen. And this is the majority of my black ink work in my sketchbook are these four tools. So a large acrylic marker, uh, a Pentel color brush, Pentel pocket brush, and then a Lamy Safari fountain pen filled with black ink. And these are all waterproof, right? Um, and I love working with that stuff. So that's my favorite. Um, these are a little bit more of a challenge, these uh, pit um, parallel pens. But, you know, to mix it up, I'll pull those out every now and then. And as you can see, I just have tons of drawing materials. So if the mood strikes, you know, and I might go months, but um, I generally am a more graphite sort of orientated uh, drawer. Um, Lloyd asks, do you actively think about composition or layout when working your sketchbook, or does an interesting layout just come to you naturally? Um, so, so both. Sometimes I am designing an illustration. I wonder if I have this in the sketchbook. You know, oftentimes sketches are just sort of free floating um, sort of things. Let me find one that's just sort of a free floating drawing. All right, so it's just sort of a free floating head. There's no, you know, it's just drawing a profile and coming up with a character. Other times it's more assignment based where I'm saying, okay, I'm going to draw a rectangle and I'm going to tell a story. So I've got to compose the whole picture, right? So I, I go both ways. Um, now these are more, you know, sort of rendered out, finished, start to finish. This one started with just the drawing of a dog or a wolf. And then I added like leaves and I thought, oh, I should draw a rectangle around this and compose it as a picture. So it kind of organically just sort of happened. But other times it's like I start with a rectangle um, and these are more, you know, finished style drawings, but your drawings don't have to be that um, complex. Um, I have maybe in my smaller sketchbook. I mean, these are just sort of random, right? Like this one, I started building, you know, a border. Or I guess it's this one right here. A border on it. Um, is it just sort of slowly grew? Um, but this one, you know, didn't. So that's just kind of whatever. And it's soft and loosey goosey. You know, there's no compositional ideas. So it, it all depends on kind of what I'm thinking at the time and, and how I'm working. So, um, but, you know, hey, if you want to um, get better at composition, then drawing little rectangles and filling them, right? Like you could, let's say you want to improve your compositional skills and abilities. A great thing to do is to log into a website or maybe play uh, like Netflix, like watch Netflix and pause a movie every 30 seconds and then draw the composition that you see in the film that you're watching, right? And so then you can sort of start exploring like, oh, placement of characters in relationship to architecture, landscape, right? How close, how far away, what things are in foreground, middle ground, background, you know, lighting, like dark things, mid-tone things, light things. Uh, it's a great way to sort of practice composition is just to sort of copy compositions. You can do that with famous painters as well. So you can just get on the Metropolitan Museum of Art's website and look at your favorite painter like Degas and then do a little teeny Degas drawing, copy, right? And just practice composition. It's a great way to learn. So, um, so I don't, I, it never comes just naturally. Um, you have to work at it. Anonymous said, you said there are a lot of bad examples of sketchbook work online. Can you elaborate on what we should avoid doing? Um, so um, I, I think it's always best to look at people who are really good. So a lot of people post their sketchbooks. So if you get on YouTube and just type in sketchbook walkthrough or sketchbook demonstration or my Cal Arts sketchbook application uh, rejection, I mean, there are hundreds of videos of people just flipping through their sketchbooks and they're talking and they're giving you these long winded uh, reasons behind the thing that they drew. Um, ugh, I mean, it's like a 40 minute video and you know, you get 20 minutes into it and you're like, I'm wasting my time. So I would avoid those kinds of things. 
I would say like look up artists that you admire. You know, and you all have different artists that you admire. So let's say you love Studio Ghibli, right? The um, the uh, right the animation studio. Uh, then I would probably look up who their animators are and then look for their drawings in their sketchbooks and see what kind of drawings they make and look at their work, right? Because then you are looking at the best, right, in a series. So like who is an animator at Cartoon Network if you're into cartoons? Who are they? Do they have examples of sketches online? Maybe they have a personal website. Maybe they have their Instagram page and then you can kind of look. Right? And I think those are really good examples. So I think, you know, finding where you want to go, you know, Leonardo da Vinci sketchbooks are amazing, right? Just Degas sketchbooks are surprisingly bad. Um, and so it's it's actually kind of fun to look at it because it made me feel a lot better about my own drawings when I looked at some of his sketchbook drawings. Now, not as, not as uh, pastels of dancers or anything like that. Those are beautiful. But like his quick notes that he was taking, you know, when he was out on a walk or at the Moulin Rouge or whatever, like he's got these terrible drawings. And I just made me feel like, oh, okay, that gives me permission if Degas makes bad drawings and he's in all the museums, then I can make draw bad drawings and not worry about being in museums. I can just make bad drawings and it's okay. So, um, yeah, so hopefully uh, that um, answers that question. Let me uh, go back to some of these other questions. Should you have a lot of nice finished drawings in your sketchbook or is more rough, messy drawings or like working drawings, different variations of a character and thumbnail sketches okay? Um, I, uh, I think a, a variety is great. If you get going on a drawing and you're just loving it, and you just kind of go to finish and it's a polished, beautiful drawing, that's okay. If your whole sketchbook is full of that, that's okay too. But like I mentioned um, earlier, when I'm looking uh, at student sketchbooks in particular, um, I'm looking for sort of honesty. Are you drawing the things that you like to draw and are you exploring? So if you're drawing, designing a character for maybe a children's book, are you drawing that character in different positions? You know, what does the character look like from the side versus from the front? What does it look like when they're feeding the dog or taking the dog on a walk or sleeping with the dog or, you know, running with the dog? Like you're exploring and pushing yourself creatively. Um, I think that is just as valuable and sometimes more telling because you're sort of trying to work things out. Those of you who are in, you know, I don't know if there's anybody from my um, spatial drawing class here today, but, you know, I, I challenge students, you know, your sketchbook can be a place where you practice, you know, spatial drawing. So you're practicing drawing in one point perspective. If I just draw cubes, fill a whole page full of one point cubes, whole page full of two point cubes, a um, whole page full of two point, um, you know, pyramids, or I'm going to practice my ellipses. All of those things are also important. And a sketchbook is a great place to do that because, again, it's this thing that you have with you. So you've got five minutes, you can't do a nice polished drawing, but I can sit down and practice drawing one point perspective cubes right in that five minutes and it's going to go a long way in me improving so having a variety i, I think maybe that uh, hopefully answered that question parker how does one develop a love for sketching I love to paint in oils but i never have a desire to sketch even though i know the importance of having sketchbooks i would rather jump right into painting ah oh, don't we all like um i would much rather paint as well just know that painting is drawing all painting is drawing, right? It's just that you're switching the tool. So if you improve in the way you make a drawing, you will improve in the way you make a painting. So if you're having struggles in your paintings, let's say in proportion, right, or contour, like these are drawing problems, right? These aren't painting problems. If you're having problems in value study, right, like what is light, medium, dark, and that structure in your painting, a drawing is a great way to practice those things so that you can apply them. So if you think of all the great painters, let's just pick John Singer Sargent, famous American expatriate painter, portrait painter. Um, go look up John Singer Sargent, look at his paintings, excellent sort of a la prima painter, but then type in John Singer Sargent drawings. And he did a ton of drawing. And he picked a material that was very painterly, right? He'd do a lot in charcoal because charcoal as a tool is very soft and fluid and kind of works not 
unlike oil paint. Okay, he didn't practice working in pastels, but he worked in charcoal. And I thought that's really interesting. It gives you kind of the same edge qualities. So you might consider saying, well, if I like to do oil paints, um, maybe practicing in charcoal would be a really great way, you know, in my sketchbook to sort of improve my painting. Or, you know, you do things like as you plan your paintings, um, your sketchbook can be a great place to plan your work. So it might be a place where you study composition, how you're going to execute your painting how you're going to deal with background, foreground, milligram, what are the things you're going to eliminate, what are the things you're going to include. And like I mentioned, some people actually paint oil paintings in a sketchbook. So you can do that. You can get one of these like three ring bound sketchbooks that have like a heavier paper, like watercolor paper. You can open it up, you can tape it so it doesn't work. You just sell the paper, let it dry, and then you can do an oil paint right on it or you can paint in acrylic so you don't have to prep the painter paint or the paper excuse me or you can do watercolors right and and that's a form of sketching and so like this is my watercolor sketchbook and it's just full of you know i would take this with me and we'd go on vacation um and i would just do like evening sunsets i take a walk i, I think we like went to flaming gorge and i just uh you know in the evenings after dinner I would sit out you know, on the shore and just paint the landscape. Right? So yeah, painting is a great way to keep a sketchbook. And it doesn't have to be an either or. And for some of you who are struggling, like maybe you have a paint, uh, sketchbook for painting and a sketchbook that's uh, for drawing. So I hope that answered that. <clears throat> How do you get out of your head if you want to draw, but your head or your hand freezes up because you're scared of drawing something and making a like bad and, and of drawing something badly. Okay, yeah, the the blank page syndrome, right, is is terrifying, right? Because you look at that nice sheet of paper and you're like, I, I'm not confident with my skills. Well, if you never draw it, you'll never improve, right? So there's that aspect that's kind of pressuring you. So a good thing to do is just make a like just ruin the sketchbook uh, to start with. So make marks on every piece of paper. Like just go through with a pencil and just like, like get them dirty. Uh, or you can do something called a primed sketchbook, where you can like get paints, um, maybe watercolors, maybe some graphite, and you just go through and just randomly start coloring on a page. Go a couple pages, do a watercolor blob, uh, do a little ink thing, and then you've sort of ruined the majority of your sketchbook. And then you go through and it's like, oh, okay, well. You know, I did this stupid blob. All right, so the page is ruined, so it doesn't matter what I draw in here. The page is already like destroyed. So now I'll just go find a photograph and draw a guy. You know, and then and then I draw the guy, and then for some weird reason I think, oh, maybe I should draw concentric rings, and it now looks like the edge of a tree trunk. And it doesn't make any sense with the other things that I've drawn, but it doesn't matter, right? Or if you do a terrible drawing. You know, you creatively cut it out like I did on this one, right? Just covered it with black ink, covered it out, cut it out, played with it. And then, you know, something started interesting started happening. I thought, well, gosh, that's it starts giving me an idea. Maybe I can cut holes in my paper and then have them windows. And right. And then I can start, you know, if I do a terrible, really bad one, I just cover it in paint and and then draw a drawing next to it. And then I don't stress about it. Right. So that sometimes just helps. Um, just sort of messing up your paper. Um, but if you do a bad drawing, like I said, it's okay. Like no puppies will die if you do a bad drawing. And it's your sketchbook, so you don't have to share it with anybody, right? Now, if, if you are sharing it for the BFA application, then yeah, we're gonna see it, but we all know where you're at, right? We all know that you're an artist in, you know, that's trying to grow and develop. So we're I'm I'm gonna expect some bad drawings in there if I'm sort of jurying your sketchbook. Um, and so that's okay. So uh, you know take find ways to take the stress off. Maybe give yourself a time limit and then you just go for it. Um, sometimes drawing with a tool that you can't erase really helps because then you just have to you just have to put it down and see what happens and deal with whatever mark you make. OK, um, another thing that's really helpful, I think, is to go and do uh, maybe you've tried something in a class, right? Like so I, I have my students do in my drawing one class blind contour drawing, right? Which is the kind of drawing where you don't look at the paper and you just look at the subject 
and you, you know, the drawings are going to look bad anyway, right? Because your hand-eye coordination isn't perfect. And so they're going to be a little wonky. Um, that's a great way to sort of get over just making bad drawings because like the outcome already is going to be tainted, right? It's going to be weird looking. And then it's like, it takes the pressure off. And then you sort of say, well, okay, so what are some of the other drawing things that we tried in my drawing class? Let's try those in my sketchbook. Let me practice those things. Um, if you want, there are some great resources. Um, so I have a whole bunch of books. Like, like this is a fun book to look at. Um, it's called Drawn In, and it's just examples of really great sketchbooks. Again, you can sort of try some of these things out and see if they work out for you. Um, you might want to do something like this. Read this if you want to be great at drawing. Um, and what's really cool is they just go through different drawing exercises, it's like little assignments. So it's like drawing silhouette. They show you an artist who works in silhouette. And look, this guy's sketchbook is a bunch of like scrap paper, maybe bought at a thrift store. So it'll give you like, hey, you could do this. And then it'll tell you, take an object, draw it in silhouette, lightly draw the outline. You know, it, so it gives you a prompt. It's like, here, try this out. And there's a whole bunch, right? of books like that. This one is another really great one. It's called Drawing Masterclass. Again, it's like um, it'll talk about a certain style of drawing. It'll show you examples of artists who work that way and then gives you kind of prompts like here, try this as subject matter. Try this uh, uh, this kind of tool. So if you're struggling with what to try, you know, sometimes books like this are really great. You can find these online. You can find these in the bookstore. You can find these at the library. So if you don't want to spend any money, um, so those are other sort of, you know, jump starts. Uh, how do you find sketching drawing challenges? Just search drawing challenge. Yeah, I, I think so. Or um, talk with your classmates or other people that you might know. So like Inktober is a great one, March of the Robots. But if you just Google search like drawing challenge, you'll discover there are a bunch that I haven't even considered or thought of. What is the place, uh, best place to get art supplies? Curious about acrylic pens. Okay, um, if you wanna to go to a physical store, um, if you live in Utah and you have access to a car, then going um, to uh, the Blick Art Supply, Dick Blick Art Supplies in Salt Lake, it's, 2100, it's 21st South and between 11th and 13th East in Sugar House. Um, you can't park behind their building. You can't, there's a little bit of street parking in front, but you actually have to kind of go around the corner uh, behind Millie's Hamburgers. You park there, they have a whole parking lot, and you have to walk half a block to get to their store. But they, it's like, uh, if you're into art supplies, it's like a, you'll be a kid in a candy store. Like, it's ridiculous how much stuff they have. Um, the, the markers in particular, anything sort of graffiti related is always behind a locked uh, behind a locked door. Um, you can kind of look at them, um, but they have to unlock it for you um, so that you can retrieve it. Same thing with the spray paints. Um, but that's, uh, they have all the, they have colors and all sorts of stuff. Dick Blick also has an online retail presence. So if you get online and if you go there and sort of look at stuff, you can even, you know, maybe take one of your little mini sketchbooks and a pencil and then write down some brands. And if you're like, like to, comparison shop, then you can get online and see if you can find it cheaper somewhere else if you're cost conscious. If you are in Provo Orem area, uh, Artist Corner is going out of business, but they carry a lot of the same supplies that Dick Blick does. And right now it's 30 to 70% or 60% off of everything in their store. So you might head over there. I don't know what they have by way of inventory. Um, they're on State Street in Orem, but look them up, Artist Corner. Um, also, most craft supplies like Hobby Lobby, um, what like Michael's, Joanne's Fabrics, they have some art supplies, so they might be great for finding some of those things. You probably won't find acrylic pens there though, because that's kind of a specialty. How does one develop a love for sketching? Oh, sorry, went through that one. Um, uh, finding it, okay, Jessica, this is a great question. I'm finding it really hard to find time to draw my personal sketchbook on top of schoolwork. Right, you've got so much going on. Do you have any tips to balance that? Um, I don't. Other than if um, if you just sort of give yourself, it doesn't have to be a ton of time. Like I, sometimes we feel like, oh, I should be sketching an hour a day in my sketchbook. That's a that's a lot of work. I was a student just like you, and I had a I had a figure drawing teacher who did something really mean to us. He said, okay, uh, this semester you have to do 500 figures 
in a sketchbook by the end of the semester. 500 figures meant that I had to do seven figure drawings a day, every day for that semester. Um, that was a lot of figure drawing, okay? Um, and at the beginning, I was really mad, but um, when I worked it out, like I had to do it, like I just was forced to do it. So what ended up happening was um, when a teacher was demoing um, or when we were talking in another class that wasn't art related, I was drawing. And a curious thing kind of happened. I was able to focus more on like what they were talking to me about if it wasn't visually engaging. Um, and that really helped, you know, I just all of a sudden discovered I had time like, oh, I have to go meet with Professor X, you know, and he was with another student. So I'm waiting for five minutes while he was working with that former student. Then I, I had five minutes. So I bring out the sketchbook, position my hand and then I sketch my hand as part of, you know, that sort of challenge I had. So I, I found time in sort of weird little um, places, which meant that I had to have my sketchbook with me everywhere I went and I had to have something to draw with everywhere I went. OK, and that really made a difference. The other thing you can do is just sort of um, the uh, the movie um, director, David Lynch, right? And there's all sorts of like crazy stuff. You can find his YouTube videos where he just says hello every morning and tells you what the weather is in Los Angeles every day. But he's kind of a creative, really interesting guy. Um, he he talks about having a routine. Um, because if you have a routine, then it frees up your creative mind to do other things. So if you say to yourself, okay, every morning I'm going to get up, I'm going to brush my teeth, I'm going to eat my, you know, I'm going to make my tea or my coffee or my breakfast smoothie or whatever it is, I'm going to have that. Um, I'm going to, you know, get dressed and then for 10 minutes, I'm going to draw. And whatever comes to mind, you know, it's kind of like stream of consciousness. I, I don't even have a, I don't even have a plan, but you'll start to develop a plan the more you do this. Um, and I'm just going to draw for 10 minutes. I'm going to set a timer on my phone and draw for 10 minutes. And then once, once it's over, I'm just like, cool, shut my sketchbook and then move on. 10 minutes, you can find 10 minutes, right? And again, it's like, ah, if I do 10 minutes a day for a week, I've drawn in my sketchbook for over an hour. That's significant, right? Um, so like look for little opportunities to do that. If you're waiting, you know, I wait for kids uh, when I take them to dance, right? And I'm waiting for my girls to get out of a ballet. I have my sketchbook with me. And if I have 10 minutes, I can, I have a choice, right? I can surf uh, Twitter and doom scroll, or I can play a game on my phone, or I can break out a pencil and my sketchbook and I can draw. Oh, what do I draw? I'm sitting in my car, uh, you know, there's nothing to draw there. Well, I can draw the other cars and people around me. I can draw stuff out of my head. I can plan some ideas. I can write some sort of personal journal entry and then draw something like and I'm going to get interrupted because the kids are going to come out in five minutes. So I don't have a ton of time, but that five minutes, you know, stretched, you know, over the three days that I have to go pick girls up from dance becomes 15 minutes. That's 15 minutes more than I did before. So, so you know, you can sort of plan it, but having your sketchbook with you um, is is super helpful. So, and yeah, we've got a lot to do, but um, here's the dirty secret. When you're done with school, um, life doesn't get any easier because you're still, you know, again, you're working and like, how do I find time to like creatively draw and have fun? So hopefully that um, helps with that answer. <sighs> Um, and I share examples. Shala, you'll have to, um, uh, I'll, I'll have to show you that in class, or maybe that's something that we can do next semester about priming a sketchbook, because it's a lot of fun. Um, and you can actually prime a huge sheet of paper, and then you cut it up, and then you bind a sketchbook out of it. So it places the weird things that you do in your sketchbook in random places, and then you have to deal with it. But you know that thing that I showed today, where you just take um, yeah, you just take like the uh, photocopies, so you randomly make a bunch of photocopies in that transfer pen. So I just you know put that into my sketchbook. Now I have to deal with it, right? So that's a great way to prime it. So now I can go back and go, oh, do I add a mustache on him? Do I complete his body? You know, uh, what could I do with that and make it kind of interesting? Maybe I redraw it, copy it, 
I don't know. That's a way of priming. Right? That might be a lot of fun. Um, okay. Are there any other questions? Thank you guys for uh, logging in. I am at the two hour mark. I didn't think I could talk that long, but here I am. I have finished uh, talking. Um, hopefully this was useful for you. Uh, like I said, when we get back to um, normal life, uh, when everybody has been vaccinated and we can meet together in a large group uh, in the GT building on campus, um, I think it'd be a lot of fun to sort of have like a try it day or maybe we all get together and bind our own sketchbooks. Any of those things would be, I think, really wonderful. So um, look for that for fall semester if you're around. Um, we'll be holding at least one of these every semester. And if you know if we could continue to get really good uh, response like we did today, 34 attendees, you know, I think we fluctuated between 34 and 40 people here today. I think that's really great. And I'm really grateful that you took time out of your day uh, to join me here. Thanks again. You guys have a wonderful day and get drawing. Bye.